Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Selman Ansari. I am a senior consultant at uh, Bindman's in the uh, public law team. And we at Bindman's are really, really delighted to be holding this engagement for the 12th year. This is a collaboration between ourselves and uh, UCL. Uh, and we're very grateful to UCL for co-hosting this with us and having um, uh, this event yet again. Every year, um, we try and pick on a topic that has uh, uh, been raised with us, that has excited us in, in the things that we have seen and done often with our clients over the past year. And uh, this year, we've alighted on this topic about the role of charities and third sector organisations in civil society. We've spoken to a lot of our charity and third sector clients, and they are increasingly uh, concerned about the added burden of what they see as services that the state used to provide being put onto their shoulders. So we want to talk, we thought we would talk about that in this long-standing engagement that we have with UCL. Um, I'm gonna let Polly uh, Toynbee introduce the speakers and the debate properly, but I just want to say two things. Uh, firstly, uh, we've got a slight change in uh, personnel on, uh, 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 on the panel. We were due to have Barbara Keeley, MP, uh, unfortunately, she's been detained by parliamentary business, so we are privileged to have Fiona McTaggart, who was, up until the last election, the long-standing and very distinguished MP for Slough, um, and who also was a minister uh, with uh, uh, a portfolio that, that covered this topic previously. Finally, um, this event is being recorded, um, so I have been asked to point that out. And finally, finally, uh, we hope that you will join us for some drinks and networking after um, the event. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Polly Toynbee. Thank you, Polly. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is a, a fascinating subject, and it couldn't be a better time to be talking about it. Is charity the new welfare state? Are charities the new not-for-profits? taking on all the burdens of the state without any of the benefits. Well, I think we would all start by agreeing there's going to be a wide range of opinion, I think, on this panel, and I'm sure amongst you as well. But I think we would all start by agreeing that charities are a, a huge good and a vital lifeblood of uh, any decent society. I think one of the most shocking things about the fall of the wall and the end of the Soviet Union and that year was to find there was no civil society, there was nothing. Uh, there was nobody at all. And when the state sort of collapsed, uh, apart from you know the sort of Reaganites moving in and marketizing everything, there was no safety net of any kind. There was no tradition of any kind of uh, citizens helping each other through any sort of charitable enterprise. It had been wiped out because the idea of charity itself was thought, thought to be uh, anti-state. Um, and so I suppose we'll be discussing to some extent the balance between what should the state do, what should charities do, uh, where does the burden fall? Um, and I don't suppose anybody will take an absolutist view that it should you know, all be one or the other. <laughs> he will probably apply. Uh, he will be very handy for those purposes of general controversialism, which you know well. That's Mark Littlewood, who is the Director General of the Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, then we're going to have Sir Stuart Etherington, who is the Chief Executive of NCBO, the National Council of Technology Organisations. And then uh, Carol Sakura who is a uh, leading oncologist and uh, in the private sector and a great advocate for the private sector in health. And when Fiona comes, as we've just heard, she was uh, at one point a Home Office Minister with responsibility for charities and has done a lot of work with charities. And you, the audience, as you would have seen from the list of yourselves, are a very distinguished lot uh, of lawyers of all sorts but also many people from the charity sector, many very different and various parts of it. So I'm sure we're going to have a terrifically lively debate. It's not the sort of debate where we have a vote at the end, but uh, what we want is rigorous and vigorous discussion. So Mark will lead us off. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Polly, and thanks very much to UCL and Bindman's for hosting this. I hope that I don't come across in the next eight to ten minutes as being too much of an absolutist. 
Um, but I do want to sketch out uh, my thinking, and I think um, I'm going to try to slay what I consider to be a few myths as well. But in tackling the problem, the, the blurb for this debate says, uh, in the response to the Grenfell Tower catastrophe and the Manchester terror attacks, we've seen a bigger role than ever for third sector groups. Is this to be celebrated as a renaissance of community spirit? Or does it simply highlight the failure of central government to do its job? And I think my answer is that those are not mutually exclusive conclusions. Uh, they could both be an uplift in community spirit and highlighting the failure of central government to satisfactorily run a welfare and support system. So let, let's start with the welfare state. And I have no doubt that many of you in the audience, or, or indeed our distinguished chair, may contest some of what I have to say, but I think we need to define what we mean by the welfare state. I suppose a wide definition of it would be the government's provision of health, education, and all transfer payments, uh, out of work benefits, housing benefits, child benefits, and the like. And that comes to in around about terms 60% or more of total government spending. Uh, if you were just to look at transfer payments alone, uh, money taken from one cohort and transferred to the other, and I'm including state pensions in this regard, so all money transfers overseen by the state, that would come to, in roundabout terms, £230 billion pounds this year. Um, or if you were to divide that onto a per household basis, the, the bill or, or the handouts or the turnover comes to around about £10,000 for every household in Britain. And for all of the talk of austerity uh, since the coalition government was elected seven years ago, and there have been cuts in government spending, government spending remains enormous, um, at around about 42 or 43% of GDP. And for all of the criticisms of specific government policies, whether that be around recalibrating who, who gets disability allowances, or whether that might be the bedroom tax or spare, spare room subsidy. The total amount of money spent uh, has not reduced markedly at all. And over our lifetimes has gone up colossal, um, not just in real cash terms, but as a proportion of national income. If you were to look back to 1960, you had a, uh, a state sector that accounted for in roundabout terms 30% of GDP. And as I say now it is about 43%, 43 pennies in every pound spent in Britain are dispensed by the state. So we have a, a, a colossal state sector, one that we might complain is being inefficient, one that we might complain gets its priorities wrong, one that we might claim is making uh, expansions in some areas of expenditure and reductions uh, in, in, in others and getting that wrong, but it is huge. We are spending typically year on year more on health, welfare and um, support for the poor or identified vulnerable groups really than we have ever done before and colossally more than we did at the start of my lifetime 45 years ago. Uh, I think that charity in my ideal and optimal world uh, would replace the welfare state. I don't claim that we can do that overnight. I am not such a purist that I don't need any form of income redistribution conducted by the state at all. But I actually think the mark of a civilised society would be one if we could get there eventually, and I accept it is something of a utopian vision, in which the welfare state was unnecessary, either because we have found such economic growth and opportunity that poverty would be colossally reduced, uh, and or because people were voluntarily and philanthropically stepping up to the plate. What would not be to like about that world? I don't think you can bring it about overnight, if you like, by force. I don't think it would suddenly close down all of the state apparatus that is designed to uh, help those in need, that charity the very next day would step up to the plate and fill it. But in my vision for what I would like the United Kingdom to be like in, uh, say, 50 years' time, it would be that. It would be a colossally bigger charitable sector and a much smaller 
welfare state. And my reasoning for that, where, whatever you think the overall state welfare bill should be, is that the government, central government, run by politicians of either hue, are hugely inefficient at delivering money to the points of greatest need. Centralised plans designed in Whitehall, however well-intentioned, are very often a long way away from being optimally efficient. And in maybe civil society work on the ground gets an awful lot closer to that. So I favour whether you believe that there should be a greater role for charity and a lesser role for the state. I certainly favour great localisation of the way that we provide welfare. And if I could just use the, the controversy over the, the spare room subsidy or the bedroom tax as an example. Uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that the policy is well intentioned that the aim of the government has been to uh, use the housing stock of the United Kingdom more efficiently than it is presently being used and to encourage people to downsize if they are reliant on state support for the size of the house they are in. Uh, that does seem to be the intention of the policy. But to have a one-size-fits-all policy rolled out from Whitehall and imposed across the nation strikes me as extremely stupid and inflexible. The housing stock is radically different in different parts of the United Kingdom. In some areas of the country, it's extremely difficult to downsize. There aren't any one bedroom or two bedroom flats to move people into. The housing stock is particularly large. So I would favour localised solutions. They could be potentially done by the state, but I think they're not very well done by the central state and are emphatically much better done by charity. So I would like to see the charitable sector given every encouragement to begin, begin to cry out for welfare state, not the other way around. I would actually like this to see as a strategy, the hope and the aim and the ambition that the charitable sector will do more and more as we become more affluent, as people have generally greater abilities to give either their time or their cash to charitable works. And we would want to see, inch by inch, not overnight the shock therapy, a winding down of the state providing, trying to provide welfare, help and assistance and opportunity, and a winding up and an encouragement to all charities that step forward. Uh, it was also mentioned in the uh, preliminary uh, introductory remarks uh, that I received back to It's now seven years since uh, the big society was, well, it's going launched. I'm not really sure it ever got off the ground. Launched implies some sort of upwards trajectory. Uh, the big society, I think, was actually uh, an interesting idea, but something of a stillborn. It was very difficult at times when David Cameron and uh, his political allies launched it to work out whether he really was imagining a complete revolution in the voluntary and charitable sector in the United Kingdom, or whether he was doing a little more than just in, like you know, appalling the Rotary Club and the Cub Scouts. And the, uh, sometimes came across as the second. But I think the time has come because uh, we are still spending a huge amount of money uh, on welfare and the government in total is spending more money than it raises in taxation and it almost certainly is spending more money than it can raise in taxation on a year-by-year -year basis. But we should revisit some of those guiding principles of the big society and we should strive to embrace a regulatory tax framework that will make it easier for charities to do the work on the ground efficiently that the state does badly and inefficiently now. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Polly. Well, I, I was on to some of what Mark said because I find myself in agreement with some of it, which uh, may surprise some people, but not with, with other aspects. Uh, I think it's probably important to put it in perspective what is the scale of voluntary sector activity at the moment uh, compared to the scale of state activity. And, and it's quite a lot of big disparity uh, between the two. Uh, the sector now turns over just over £45 billion pounds, and it employs about 600,000 people. But that's quite across quite a range of activities. Uh, it's principally concentrated in care, education, and training, that's where the majority is. And over the last 10 to 15 years, 
there's been a significant increase in the scale of voluntary sector activity. Uh, slightly diminished in the last two or three years, uh, but generally there's been a growth in the sector uh, over that period. Now, it's interesting to, to see why that has occurred. And it hasn't occurred uh, in terms of analysis by some great upswing in philanthropy or private donations. That's kept pace with inflation, slightly above inflation. Uh, the majority of donations to charities are very high volume, small value donations from individuals. Uh, but the main reason that the sector has expanded during this period has been, it's been contracting with the state. Uh, so it has been actually taking more money from the state in order to deliver public services. In particular, public services in employment, in training, in care, and in health. Those are the big ticket items when it comes uh, to uh, contracting. But of course, what that means is that the sector has become more dependent on public finances. And therefore, as public finances have changed, uh, the sector has changed with it. So as public finances have shifted, so the amount of money available to the voluntary sector has not necessarily increased in the last two or three years. That's certainly been true. It's basically flatlined. And what, it, it, but it has also, if you like, changed the ecology of the sector. Uh, there are 160,000 charities in England and Wales. The vast majority of them are very small. The vast majority of them have incomes of less than £50,000 a year. But the scene is dominated by a relatively small number of quite large organisations, and the contracting process has tended to accelerate that. The reason for that is very simple. Uh, the state has tended to contract at scale. Only a very small number of organisations can contract at that level of scale, and therefore only a very small number of organisations have benefited. So the big have got bigger, uh, the small have sort of carried on, and the people in the middle ground have actually found it very difficult to contract the services. This, I think, has been particularly true for two reasons. One is in, in employment policy, where contracting has become a very, very large scale activity, uh, where the private sector has tended to be more effective at securing prime contracts, and voluntary organisations have subcontracted to those prime contractors. So that's been a push. The other thing is that the vast majority of social care funding uh, which is the other main spend in the voluntary sector, has, has been through local government. And local government has been particularly affected by changes in public spending uh, patterns and change over the last few years. So that's had a direct effect on the local voluntary sector. So the picture that I'm painting is of a sector where philanthropy hasn't grown significantly. Uh, what has driven the changes in the voluntary sector has principally been its relationship with the state rather than something independent of the state. Um, so it has a sort of odd symbiotic relationship with the state. Um, just some thoughts really on the advantages that the voluntary sector has in the delivery of public services or the delivery of services, which Mark has uh, sort of touched on really, but I just wanted to uh, reinforce that. But I also want to talk about what the sector cannot do. And you may think this is not important, but some people consider it to be very important, and the sector can't do this. What it can do, and some of these have already been commented on, is it offers a lot of variety, it offers a lot of flexibility, it tends to be much more localised, it tends to be much more engaging with communities, it's able to tailor support much more uh, than large public bureaucracies. Um, it's able, I think, to empower people individually. Uh, and also to change the pattern of the way in which services are provided. Uh, so a word I don't particularly like, but co-production, the idea that the users of service and the provider of service are intimately engaged in defining the way that that service uh, will be uh, provided. Um, it also, I think, um, it engages volunteers. There are 20 million people in the United Kingdom engaged in some form of volunteering activity. Uh, one way or another. And here I think the balance is changing. It's far more volunteering in health and care than there used to be. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest areas of growth of volunteering 
has been in library services. In fact, the only reason that some library services still exist is that people have come forward voluntarily to run them. So there's been a, a shift there. But overall levels of volunteering uh, don't really change that much. It's about 60% of people engaged in some form of formal volunteering. It peaks, uh, but it peaks when there are large sporting events available. Uh, so the next time you have a, a Commonwealth or Olympic Games, you will find games makers coming forward. I think the number was five times more people wanted to be games makers than there are actually vacancies available for people to become games makers. But the experience of these uh, events, and they're normally sporting events, uh, is that you can't sustain the increase. So people come forward because of the specific event. They don't then continue uh, to uh, volunteer. Uh, the other thing that I think is worth noting is the relationship between voluntary action uh, and, uh, I suppose, broadly advocacy. That the experience of providing the services that charities do gives them the information that they need in order to articulate the needs of a particular constituency. And this is a very common uh, combination. But of course, what people don't realise when they talk about the welfare state is that Beveridge didn't write one report, he wrote two reports. Uh, the famous report is the one that we all know about, which created the welfare state, but subsequently, shortly afterwards, he wrote a report called Voluntary Action, where he was saying that voluntary action would continue to be a, an important part of the fabric. In fact, just to quote you from Voluntary Action, he said, the vigour and abundance of voluntary action outside one's own home, individually and in association with other citizens, are the distinguishing marks of a fair society. They have been outstanding features of British life, and of course I would argue that they remain so. So the benefits, if you like, the disadvantages are, uh, and this might be important to some, not to others, is that the sector is not about equity. It is not about treating people equally. It's about spontaneous citizen reactions, often to what's happening locally. So it's more flexible, but it doesn't provide the same service. And it's not about universality. It's never been about those things. And intrinsically, it cannot be about those things. It's about individual organisations responding to needs as they see them. So they can deal with difficult issues. Uh, they, and the burdens, I think, in relation to the state is the difficulties in coping with increased scale. We've seen reduced margins. But of course the benefits are these actions are independent. Uh, they're independent and constructed by citizens. Their importance in terms of the informal agenda, uh, formal action in relation to the well-being agenda. And they importantly involve people often in the design of services, so they're inherently different. I think the argument would be that both have their places because they're trying to address different, different areas of, of social need. So I would argue that uh, uh, the uh, balance may change between voluntary action and state action. And I think that is, there is probably an inevitability about that. If you see rising demographic need and a fairly static willingness to pay for additional public services, you're going to have to see citizens stepping up to the plate in a variety of ways, which is what they do. But I think wholesale change is more difficult to envisage. Nevertheless, I think we will see a growth in voluntary action, uh, and that's, I think, probably uh, inevitable given the circumstances in which, we, in which we're in. I don't think the ways in which we currently contract the services actually enhances the ability of independent voluntary action. Uh, so I think there's a lot more work to be done there. But generally, my argument would be you're likely to see more voluntary action. You're likely to see some shift in balance between the voluntary sector and the state and the market. Uh, I don't think it will be massive or dramatic, but I think it's something we, we need to think through. And just picking up finally on, on Mark's point about the big society, my own view about that was it was an opportunity uh, to have a vigorous debate about the role of the state, civil society, and ultimately the market as well. That debate never took place because there really wasn't the articulation of a policy framework to make it happen. It was aspirational and it was full of words, but there was no real thought through policy framework. 
My own view is that at some point, somebody, not at the moment because they're slightly obsessed by another matter, but at some point, uh, there's going to have to be some debate about what a policy framework would look like to encourage more uh, civil society activity. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Very much for the invitation. I mean, why do people give money to anybody else? Why do you do it? You've all given to charity. You must be if you come to something. I've done it. I've given to uh, people. Why do I do it? What makes that decision? And do you do it formally to make the decision, or do you do it illogically? Someone standing in the street with a can, and it's cold and it's wet, and you're giving the money really to them. You don't care what the charity is because you admire them for standing in front of you. Charity is essentially an illogical evolutionary business. Governments, and therefore taxes, are all about the words we've heard, universality and solidarity. And that is society trying to deal with a safety net of all sorts, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's malnutrition for the people. If you actually think about how you pay for anything, there are really only three ways. One is by tax, where you get something from the government. The second is uh, by insurance. You write off your car, you have an insurance policy, and, and you get it paid for. You can have health insurance, you have it government health insurance, private health insurance. It's all essentially the same financial model. And then, of course, the third thing, as the fourth thing, is uh, you can pay with cash or you can get it given to you. And that's the only four ways you can pay uh, cash taxation, insurance, or a charity. So I come from a health background, obviously, and so that, that's the only thing I know about. And is health charity logical? And the answer is no. It's from the heart, just like that. If you're illogical about health charity, what would you actually give to to save the most lives tomorrow? Do you think it's cancer? Do you think it's heart disease? Is it dementia? None of these things. Every year, nearly a million children under 10 die from diarrheal disease. It costs $10 to treat a single episode, but the treatment is not available in the places the children are dying. Patients and relatives haven't got the education. That would be, in a logical world, the prime place for all medical charities. Once you solve the problem, sanitation, cleaner water, and treatment with uh, salt solutions, not IV drips, not fancy intensive care units, then you can begin to look at other ways you can improve the health care of the world. But that's not how we're going. And I think nowhere is health, in, uh, nowhere other than health, is taxation, especially in Britain with the NHS, so confused with charity. So I've done it myself at Hammersmith. We raised eight million pounds to build a new cancer centre, which opened 15 years ago. It's still there and functioning very nicely. Uh, was that right to do that? Surely the government should have provided it. You try asking for eight million pounds for the NHS for the government, from the government. It just wasn't available. So the only way to do it was to do the fundraise. Was that logical? Of course not. People didn't give it a logical basis. They gave it emotionally because they wanted to see an improvement in the conditions of an old workhouse uh, with the roof leaking. We had a conservative MP have a bucket beside him and he was an inpatient in there. Um, what about things like scan appeals? Lots of hospitals around the country, I'm sure you've had tins thrust in your face by hospital wanting to collect money for a CT scanner. Surely, in an NHS system, that should come from the government. It should come from the taxation system, if it's needed. If it's not needed, then why collect from charity? And that's the fundamental problem. It's collected because it sounds good uh, to the public in a locale to have their own CT scanner. And then we start looking at all sorts of illogical things. There's a hospital or cancer centre in North West London that collected money for what's called a cyber It's a very expensive form of delivering radiotherapy. It costs over a million pounds, has advantages in certain circumstances for a relatively small percentage of patients. The hospital couldn't afford to use it once it had been collected, and it was only used for private patients that paid for it. This is completely illogical. It's very sad for the donors to that sort of project that there's no long-term strategy in there. And then the, the most recent thing we've got is crowdfunding for high-cost interventions in patients. And that really is a minefield. And, you know, in, in cancer, my specialty, there are certain drugs that are now over £100,000 a year to give. 
In fact, there's one that's a, a nearly half a million pounds a year to give to patients. And it's sort of unaffordable on the whole by the NHS. And we have an organization called NICE that tries to make a, a logical assessment. But people are not logical. We're all human beings. If you or someone you care for has a life-threatening disease, you want to get treated, especially if you know there's a treatment available. And that's where crowdfunding has come in uh, and is changing the way in which people work. It's also connected with information availability. You know, when I started uh, in medicine, we didn't tell people uh, if they had cancer that they had the disease. So obviously, you have the information on Google, the way in which you interact with your doctors, the way in which you interact with those that are paying for your health care is very different. Uh, than in the past. So we live in a, a changing world. The only constancy around this is change. And the changes in technology, just imagine 20 years ago, and what I've got in my pocket, just a smartphone. My, I use about 10% of the function of this phone. My kids use a bit more, and, and probably their kids are going to use about 80%, but by then they'll have it implanted in their brains. It's pretty frightening. <laughs> and they'll be, they'll be texting and doing all the other things you young people can do out there. Uh, you know, directly. So technology is changing and it brings with us different deliveries. You know, Deliveroo, um, Uber, all these things are based not on changing the car that drives you around London, but changing the way in which you call the car and the way in which you pay for that car. So just as in uh, consumerism, challenges are changing too. They have to. They have to keep up with it. But the last point I'd like to make is the biggest change that's going on is in society. And that's where charities are likely to change over the next 10, 20 years. They're not going to be the same as they are now. They're not going to be comfortable with what they The bureaucracy is running the charity. And despite the steward's intervention, helpful intervention to many of the small charities, is going to get so expensive that it's unlikely there'll be 150,000 small charities uh, in 20 years' time. So, how is society changing? Well, just a few things, and this is my opinion, all, all of you uh, will, will have your own opinion about the change of society. Uh, I think we're getting more selfish. I think people care less about others. Family structures are much less strong than they were because of divorce, mobility. I've got three kids, two of them are abroad, working abroad at the moment. If I get ill with cancer, they can't rush back and look after me. There's absolutely no, no way they can do that. Society is totally changing. I think the other thing about society that's changing is, is the role of women in society. Totally different now than when I was a medical student. Women work. And when granny gets ill, they can't stop working to go look after granny. And we are an aging society. So again, something, some provision has to be made for that change. And that will continue into the future. And then I guess the other thing, we all have this idyllic concept of village life in rural England where you have everyone caring for each other, looking after it, it's still there. And it's still there in the streets of London. You can get the same community spirit. But unfortunately, it's changing, and it's not as strong as it was. Many of the picturesque visit villages in the Cotswold are filled with software engineers working from home and traveling around the country, going abroad and so on. So very different, and that will continue that change. So I guess the, the bottom line in charity and how it influences the state it has to adapt to what's happening in the rest of society. And it's different in different countries. Rich countries, Western Europe, North America, behave very differently from poor countries. I spent some time in, in poor countries where the, the charity is in the village. Once you go out of the village, the charity is very different. There isn't the money uh, to put in hands uh, to help other people. So things are very different in these places. I think the future of charity and the state, they're intertwined. Charity always has to come from the heart. And the reason I suggest that you give money to charity is hopefully not to the draining of a nice man or woman's time wrapping a tin at you, but you, you believe in something, uh, and it, it, it moves you to give. And that's always what it's going to be. That will never change. That's the one constancy in the charity sector. And I think what governments have to do is provide the universality, the solidarity, and to incorporate in a useful, planned way charity to harness that willingness to help uh, that's really part uh, of modern existence. Thank you. Uh, Fiona's made it. At Houston Station, we had 
it, you, some of you may have experienced this, has come to a halt today, and she has come to our very circuitous route eventually to get here, which is fantastic. <coughs> now, while you catch your breath, I'll give you a little bit of a resume of what the others have just said, just to give you an idea. And as you might expect, we heard first of all from Mark Littlewood, whose idea of utopia is a fading away of the state and that philanthropy will take over all welfare functions. <coughs> Fair? A reasonable summary. Reasonable <laughs> summary. <laughs> okay. uh, then we heard from Stuart Edrington, who talked a lot about the current state of the uh, charitable sector. Obviously, he's a strong advocate for it, but he does point out it's uh, the things it can't do. The things it can't do are equity or universality. It works by spasm and enthusiasm and particular people doing things in particular places at particular times may be absolutely admirable, but you still need the state if you want universality and equity in your delivery. Uh, Carol Sakura has just said, I think that'll stir people up a bit. He said he thinks people are more selfish, are less inclined to give than before, and I think it'll be interesting to hear what all of you think about that. He also pointed, which is interesting, and it always puzzles me, to the, his own field of medicine, where there is a very peculiar charitable relationship between the NHS and people who collect money for CT scanners or for cyber knives. And so, uh, you know, shouldn't that be something that the NHS is doing anyway? What are we doing collecting money to add on to what the NHS does? It's, you know, it, it, it's a confusion there. My view is that people on the whole give to medical uh, things of that sort in a slightly different charitable spirit, i.e. they might need it themselves, <laughs> which is not quite the same as if you're giving, as you were suggesting, to, you know, children suffering, uh, for, uh, dying in, in, in poor countries just for lack of basic sanitation. So that's what we've had so far. Fiona, as you said before, is, um, was a Home Office Minister with responsibility for charity and responsibility for passing to charity laws and uh, a great expert in the subject. And so we leave it to you. I'm very sorry that I wasn't here. I was in Birmingham uh, today and getting back from Birmingham was almost impossible. It involved actually a very charitable sharing of a taxi <laughs> between a number of us who had got abandoned at Leamington Spa. And <laughs> anyway, you don't need to know those details. I, I think Harold's probably right about one thing, which is that we are less generous than we used to be. And I feel partly guilty for that, because I thought that in the 2006 Charities Act, we would actually be able to make a more giving society that by having clarity about what constituted a charitable purpose, making things like human rights be able to be a charitable purpose for the first time, that a charity had to provide public benefit, that it couldn't be just you know, a private arrangement for you and your chums, uh, might actually help to generate more generosity in people. But in fact, the truth is that charitable giving has stagnated. Despite tax breaks like um, the, uh, the arrangements whereby you can, uh, the charity can claim back tax uh, contributions that you've made, which was introduced by Gordon Brown. I have to say, in that budget where he made that tax change, I was the only member of parliament who noticed. He was very grumpy. It was the biggest giveaway in the whole budget. Um, anyway, we actually are giving less, and I think we should worry about that. Charitable giving, are, we've got richer. Our assets have inc increased enormously. And yet the percentage of households who give fell by 5% between 1978 and 2010. And the biggest decrease in giving is amongst younger people. And so that makes one worry about the future of charities. Uh, the monthly household giving is about £14 a month, exactly the same as it was 10 years ago. Now, I understand that austerity has squeezed people's incomes, but an awful lot of people have got an awful lot of big assets that they didn't used to have, and yet they're not 
being charitable with those assets. And I think that's a big challenge. Why do I think that that's happened? I think part of it is that we haven't actually put energy into promoting the concept of giving. I think part of it is the decline in religion. Every religion makes giving part of their, their gig, whether it's zakat or whether it's alms or tithing or whatever. Um, I think those things have contributed to it, but I actually think there's another thing which has contributed to it. And the first time I noticed it, it was described by Darkus Howe, who some of you might know or remember, who was a, an African-Caribbean activist in London, and he was complaining about Ken Livingstone, and he said, you nationalised us! And by which he meant that the activism of the black communities had been kind of incorporated by the GLC and by the GLC's giving, and he didn't like it. He felt that the kind of enterprise which was part of the community organisations which he had helped to build and create had been incorporated into the way the GLC operated, and he didn't like it. And I think, I think he was right, and I think what's happened since then is actually a much worse kind of incorporation, as it were. I think the way in which the state has commissioned charities to do its job has actually taken some of the soul out of charities. And what charities have done, in order to compete with the likes of Circle and all those very clever big corporations who have massive bidding operations and so on, lots of charities have actually bid for contracts at less than cost price. And so they lose money on providing state services. Now, there have been some great examples who've done it differently. Um, Victor Adeboali at Turning Point said, actually, that's not what a charity should do. I will make Turning Point into a community enterprise and we will make sure that we bid cost price on every uh, contract that we go for. But not a lot of charities still fall for this. And because charities are small, they actually can't compete with the big infrastructure of those big organisations who want to provide local services in order to increase their capacity and their profits. And I think that we need to stop and think about this because I think that that is part of the reasons why people don't give because they think I pay taxes for that stuff so why why do I have to give to subsidize taxes I would like a fairer tax system and not have to dig into my pocket to give to the kind of charities who do this kind of thing and I therefore think that the whole enterprise of making charities do statutory jobs has actually diminished the power of charities enormously. Yesterday, I was at a meeting with a government minister uh, to talk about the work of a charity that I chair. It's, uh, the charity is called Common Wheel, and the work that we've done was a 10-year project called Reunite. We're an action learning charity. We test out housing solutions to social injustices. And we thought we were testing out a way to help women leaving prison look after their own children. So we provided housing and support for women offenders who came out of prison to be reunited with their children. Because before then, when a woman leaves prison, she's just on her own. Her children are being looked after by someone else while she's in prison. She can't get family housing because uh, she doesn't have a family with her. So she's not entitled. But she can't get a family with her because she hasn't got fam family housing. And so we fixed that roundabout. But actually, what we wanted to go and say to the minister is you shouldn't, we shouldn't need Reunite. We shouldn't need this project. Because what we learned over 10 years of providing the project <coughs> is that to put a primary caregiver in prison punishes her children. And it punishes her children really seriously with serious consequences for the rest of society. 
They don't finish their education. They become criminals themselves. And yet, if you can keep her out of prison, if you can provide sensible community punishments where she can carry on looking after her children and take responsibility for them, then actually they thrive. So that's what I went to say to the minister. And part of the message was that he should directly fund the women's centres who were set up following Jean Corston's report to actually provide alternative punishments for women to prison. And he said, oh, but if we fund the women's centres, they won't be proper charities, will they? I want, he's a doctor, I want to die in a hospice. I don't want to die in the NHS. Now, I have a lot of sympathy with that. Cicely Saunders spotted that the National Health Service, which is absolutely about stopping you being ill and dying, probably wasn't a very good place for people who are absolutely going to die. Because actually you need a different kind of care for your end of life than you do to get better, which is what the NHS is about. It's about getting you better. So I completely sympathise with his desire to die in a hospice, not a hospital. But actually, as I pointed out to him, and he looked quite surprised, it is much easier to raise charitable funds for people dying of cancer than it is for criminals. And, you know, your lovely fluffy desire that some of the ethos of women's centres might be diminished with a bit of state funding is foolish because there isn't a way that they can rattle tins. Excuse me, give us a donation for a crim. Doesn't, doesn't work very well, does it? So, actually, what I was arguing for him to do was to give them, without commissioning, without lots of rules and regulations, enough money to provide alternative sentences and to have a bit of infrastructure so that they could raise money from other places. Because that's one of their problems at the moment. They actually don't have the capacity to fundraise. And he was reluctant. And he was reluctant because they've got a belief in the probation trusts, the community uh, probation trusts, that they're the way to go. Well, of course, these trusts are commissioning themselves. So the women's centres are in a c c conflict with them. And so what do they do? Would they rather have the money for the trust or would they rather give the money to the women's centre? Well, I can tell the answer to that, and you probably can too. And so they tend to commission their own, not all of them, I'm, I'm generalising here, it isn't universally true, but they tend to commission themselves to provide these services rather than the women's centres to do so. So I suppose what I think is that the state is stupid sometimes uh, when it tries to turn charities into arms of the state. The state can do some things brilliantly. None of us... <laughs> are going to be made bankrupt by health bills. <coughs> and yet in America, it's the largest source of bankruptcy. We can do things as a state which are utterly marvellous and completely wonderful and fair, because that's one of the things about the accountability of the state. We can make sure that it's fair. And it's quite hard to do that with charities, but charities can invent things. Charities can see beyond the normal. They can realise that you need a different way of caring for people who are going to die. They can work out that, actually, rather than carrying on with a charitable project housing women and their children, it's much better not to let them, women go into prison in the first place. And so I think that the state has to be the holder of the ring. The state has to be the fundamental provider, but should work in partnership not nationalising charitable effort, but should actually be the partners of charities so that the state, for example, makes sure that the local youth club can use the uh, pitches in the parks without, you know, actually grabbing lots of money out of every kid who wants to come along to youth activities. That's part of the partnership. And I think if there is genuinely a partnership and not just between local government, but the police, the health service, and all those things, and charitable enterprise, we can be more imaginative. But 
if we try and make charities do the job of the state, we will carry on shrinking the amount of money that they can get out of giving. And that would be a true disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's your turn to have your say. Can you say who you are? My name is Aura Dresden. I'm the director of the charity, of the psychotherapy charity in North London. And I wanted to start by saying that I liked very much the way you thought about it, Karen, and the way you continued, Fiona. And I think that uh, Stuart, okay, you highlighted the main, one of the major issues that we're facing in this relationship between the state provision and charities, which is the contracting, which I think is destroying the whole thing. I'm afraid I can't agree with your utopia, not only because it's a utopia mark, but because I think the philosophy behind it is not workable. And the reason it isn't is because of what you said, is the randomness of giving. Charitable giving is based on randomness. And it cannot be planned if it is coming from individuals voluntarily however wise and well-meaning we are. And as long as the voluntary sector has been a kind of, maybe not cherry on top of the cake, but say, one of the pleasant layers that make it more plant palatable, that's fine, because the cake was provided by the state in a solid way. We knew we were not going to die on the corridor of an overcrowded hospital with a consultant that just finished another 24 hour shift. It's not like this anymore, and the state is confronting its responsibility under the myth of these contracts to the charities. And what you said is so also true. Only the largest corporations can, can be commissioned to offer services or the largest charities. And they become simply just a big private corporation. Does your own charity uh, contract take contracts? My small charity has lost its funding because of a large contract, which was, um, which we couldn't tender for, of course, because it was for millions of pounds, and we ended up fundraising penny to penny in order to provide mental health services to people. And the mental health services in the state provision are very, very poor at the moment, as everybody knows. So I think there is a basic problem. If we want to have charities, who is going to give them the money to do this stuff, right. which is in your title? And that I would like you to speak Thank this you. to address. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to take a few questions. We take them at the back. Hello, my name is Martin. I have one question for Fiona McTaggart. Um, you mentioned income inequality. And um, there's a drop in giving young people, but I do not think those two are actually cor um, correlated. As a graduate, I'm already entering the market in a huge debt. I can't afford to buy any housing. Of course, to give it will be the last of my priorities. And uh, another question for the third panel. Uh, we discussed charity in welfare states in Britain. We have a very high developed charity sector and very good working state. But what about the international charity sector? And that hypothesis or the contentious question I want to pose to you is that international charities entering uh, states which are corrupted, failed. Uh, the hypothesis I'm, I'm posing is uh, uh, these charities are basically supplementing welfare states in those countries. As a result, uh, people in those countries don't see their government is corrupt. As a result, the civil society cannot develop, and those states will never turn democratic. Uh, what is your thought about this hypothesis? Is uh, entering failed states uh, toxic in the long run, not short run, or is it healthy in the long run, not the short run? What's your own view? Uh, I think it's toxic. I think we are uh, hindering natural causes that uh, contribute towards, uh, towards sustainable civil society development if we supplement welfare state of a corrupt government. That's my view. I want to know the panel's view. Right. Thank you very much. And we'll take one more over here and then we'll come back to the panel. 
Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sinead and uh, I've worked in the charity sector now since February. Um, I work in the supportive relations team um, in the government department of a large children's charity. Um, I very much enjoy it. I speak to people on the phones all day, so I have a lot of direct um, contact with supporters of the charities. Um, and I think what I'd like to sort of ask is this idea about like, a utopian vision of charities taking over the welfare state is not something that I particularly believe in. Um, I'm much more of doing this thinking on this. Um, however, I think what I've seen since working there is people uh, expect a lot from the charity sector now in terms of how much they're contacted, how much they're asked for money, how much um, yeah, the charity sector contacts them and, and what that contact is about. I hear lots of words every day of harassment and uh, sending me things or, and things like that. And I think that's actually a result of people, the charity sector taking on a lot more work from the uh, state mm -hmm. and people <coughs> having to hold someone accountable. So where's this money going? Where does my one pound go? How much of my one pound goes directly on the services? And I think what I want to ask is how do, how do we get around this? Lots of papers all the time, uh, front, front covers of charities <coughs> harassing um, little ladies in their houses, and it's, it's very difficult. People don't want to give as much, so how, how do we get around that issue of um, that kind of thing? A lack of trust. Hang on a minute. Yes. You, and the lack of trust, do you think, is partly because people think uh, that they're working for the state anyway, or is the no, money an add-on to what the state's already providing? Yeah, I think it's the services they're providing, and therefore, uh, if, if a charity is providing a service, how much of that money, that people are more interested in the account, like what the charities are spending their money on, and who they can hold accountable for when they give money to the charity and it doesn't go to the right place. And is that reasonable or unreasonable? I think it's very reasonable to hold uh, people to account for very quickly and, and expect it to do one thing, but it doesn't necessarily come to something. Not that that happens in my life, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come back. Stuart, pick up. I don't feel you've got to answer more. Okay. What, whatever you want to I'll come back to. I'm just going to pick up too. I'm not really qualified to talk about the issue about um, uh, corrupt overseas governments and the relationship uh, between that and charities. Um, I'll pick up two. Uh, well, uh, briefly, three. Uh, first of all, young people. Um, uh, it's interesting. I, I think you're. I, I think you're absolutely accurate that, that there are too many demands on the income of, of younger people, given where they are in terms of debt. Um, however, the interesting fact about volunteering, as distinct from the giving of money, is that the data shows us that in recent years, the significant increase has taken place statistically significant is amongst young people engaging in volunteering activities. In a different way, often in micro-volunteering, they can't give up the whole Tuesday, but they, they can do pockets of time. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of hope in the fact that younger people are involved in social action in a different way. And I think that's undeniably true. Um, in terms of um, the uh, utopian vision, I, I think there are about three or four different narratives of the sector, and they go, Historically, they go up and down. So you had a small state narrative, which was pre-welfare state, and some have argued that we should return to a small state narrative and in the expectation that charity will endeavour will increase significantly. There's a partnership narrative, which I think Fiona was alluding to, which was very much, I think, where the Blair-Brown government was in terms of forming partnerships with voluntary organisations. That tended to deteriorate into what I would call um, a transactional narrative, which was much more about contracting with people to do things rather than working in partnership with them. My view is that we need to think about a slightly different narrative, which is a slightly more reinforced independence narrative, which is what can we, how can we encourage uh, greater levels of um, independence with involuntary organisations, endowments, asset transfers, etc., to make them more robust in their relationship with other sectors. They're relatively weak uh, actors. But what I'll just focus on is your fundraising and trust question. I can bore for England about fundraising. I did a review. You know you've made it when they name a review after you. But they, um, the reason for that was abuse. There, there were people who I think were... Um, some charities were engaged in um, basically activities which I don't think were ethical. Um, and they sort of stumbled into that and it needed to be redressed. Uh, and I think 
I wouldn't say this wouldn't I. I think the results of that review have led to a more robust self-regulatory structure. It was important that the sector was seen to be able to address this issue itself, rather than to depend on the state to regulate its activities. So I think that's been reasonably successful. Now, I hasten not to use the words GDPR in this context, but that will have a big impact on fundraising. And I think the answer to your question is... Go on, you've got that, yeah. All right, I can't remember. General... Da, 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 data. data protection <laughs> regulation, um, which is about basically consent. And I think that will have an impact, but I think it's an important issue for fundraising, <coughs> which is that you, I think a smaller number of consenting people who really want a relationship with you ultimately will deliver more than a larger number of people who might vaguely have heard or have got a mailing for the first time. And, and so I think ultimately it will recreate a set of relationships between fundraisers and the public on who, who generosity charities to a large extent depend. And that I think, that's the most optimistic view of what will happen. But I think the whole thrust of what I did with the review of fundraising that the government asked me to do was to think about ways in which trust and confidence could be restored into a market which was where generally where trust and confidence was ebbing away. Have you, have you got a recent opinion polling that says what, how people are feeling about charity? Yeah, there are trust barometers uh, uh, which uh, run, um, and those trust barometers were going down pretty steadily in the wake of the Olive Cook case and uh, one or two other issues. It was principally around fundraising. It was some people argue it was about campaigning. There was never any evidence for that. Um, and in fact, you ask the public, they, they, they have an expectation that charities will campaign on issues. Um, but the issue was about fundraising practices principally. That was damaging trust. It was, it, was a, it was reported by the media, so some people argue that it was magnified. But actually, this was a good piece of investigative journalism. And there was a case to answer. Since the review, um, and since the, I think the robustness of the self-regulatory structure, uh, the trust indicators have begun to recover. Now, whether it was just that, whether it's something else, it's difficult to say, but it's clearly the case that public trust and confidence in charities, which was high, was ebbing a little, has been restored to as good as ever. Carol, do you want to pick up, you're welcome to pick up anything that anybody said Beforehand, or any of the questions. I think it's very interesting. I think one thing I've picked up is the lack of faith in modern society. I think we're getting more selfish, and partly because we're losing our faith. The only data I've got for that is a Daily Telegraph article that looked at the number of communicators in the church, the different branches of the church. The Catholics, for which I'm one, did well because we're indoctrinated at the age of six to do well. You keep going into modern society. But the others did badly. But seriously, I think that is one problem. And, and, this, and that will continue if you just look around the country, the churches are empty and they're converted into pubs and bars and things like that. The second issue is can a charity make a big impact on the citizens? So I've been in NHS myself for 38 years, and the biggest impact has not come from a research charity, it's not come from anything, any major breakthroughs in cancer, it's actually come from the hospice movement that we've already heard mentioned. Beginning in the mid-60s in South London and Sydney, when I started as a student, there was nothing. I was a student across the road, and there was nothing. If you were dying in a hospital ward, in an acute surgical or medical ward, you were treated like a leper. No one wanted to speak to you, no one knew what to do. As a young doctor, you used to give old-fashioned drugs like pethidine, completely inappropriate. Uh, and then the hospice movement started, all charitably funded, and that changed the whole mindset. And now, Britain leads the world in the quality of end of life and palliative care. And that was a, 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 the injection of a relatively small amount of money from outside, but not just the money, a whole system's approach to dealing with dying patients as an important consumer of healthcare, rather than someone you just want to get out of the way, draw the screens and forget about them. So that's been a major change. I think that's what we've got to try and look for in the future in some of the newer charities that are coming. But the, the hospice movement is a very good example because it was a beacon of a new idea of a gap where nobody had thought about something that was plainly needed. But what it couldn't provide was a universal hospice service. In the end, only the state, from following that beacon, 
could provide palliative care teams, could take up the work. But in the end, if you wanted everybody to have access to it, only the state could do that. Uh, and there's still a lot of tension between uh, the funders of the NHS, the, the, the CCGs, and hospices around the country. Um, they've changed their model. It's mainly at home care with a hospice to back up the urgent deterioration of patients. But there is a lot of funding tension out there, and that's continuing. And it's sort of it's the nature of the state versus the charity. The state wants to rely on the charity and have a limited budget. The charity says, "Well, you should be funding this quite rightly." Now that's where the tension lies. I also have to add a point of information. In my role as vice president of the Humanist Association. <laughs> I have to say there is no evidence that people of faith give more or less than people with no faith. So the idea that, you know, it's, yeah, I'm afraid statistically, yeah. selfishness is even more general. Maybe the Catholics is even is <laughs> even spread amongst believers and non-believers alike. Uh, Mark, do you want to take up? Uh, let me pick up a few of these strands. The, the first one which came up with the first one of these question, but um, also. Stuart touched on was the uh, and Fiona did as well. Sort of is is big government kind of polluting the uh, the charitable sector? Um, and um, I would say I'm relatively relaxed. I'm probably agnostic, but I'm relatively relaxed <laughs> about governments uh, uh, subcontracting to charities. I think part of this is a market discovery process. You know, if a, if an innovative entrepreneurial charity discovers a really good way to help with, I don't know, the rehabilitation of offenders or getting youngsters off drugs or whatever it might be because they're on the ground and experimenting. It, it seems to me that you could then have the rather more cumbersome, slow, ponderous state actually learning from that enterprise on the ground and would make that a lot out of its program. But I would say this, and I, I think it's not the only reason. But a part of the reason is how centralised the UK government is. In terms of tax and spending, we are easily the most centralised country in the OECD. Virtually all tax and spending decisions of any meaningful import are taken uh, in Whitehall. And I would much rather see uh, government, you know, whatever level of government spending would be retained, even in my utopia, localised. I mean, rather than arguing about it's not obviously about what the level of government spending should be. But I would much rather see that control at a local level. And I think that would give smaller independent charities, if I mean, something on the ground, a rather easier fit than having to apply to, you know, roll out some colossal program on a national scale, which obviously has barriers for uh, to entry to all but the, uh, the, the few gargantuan charities. I will tackle the question of uh, failed states. Um, often the same uh, argument actually comes up about international development a from government, not just charitable work. Uh, I think it, it, I mean, it's not a good response, but it depends. Uh, and I think useful charitable work can be done, but it isn't just a displacement for the failure of government activity. There are some charities, I could find them out, I know a couple of people involved in them, who are particularly involved in trying to assist with improving the rule of law and property rights in particular countries in Africa. And if you can move that forward, even as a charitable exercise, supported by Western money, I believe that is a useful long-term development for growth, rather than seeing that as bailing out a, a, a failed or corrupt regime. Uh, and then lastly, the point about expectations. I, this is interesting. I mean, I've run in the Institute of Economic Affairs. So a quarter of my life is raising money from people. Um, but you never tell us who from. I never tell you who. No. Uh, we, are we are top of the table for protecting democracy and the truth. Um, but so, so, but I, you know, I think we're probably conscious of the same. I mean, it's obviously different raising money for research and policy institute than it is running money, you know, money for a children's charity. There are probably more differences and similarities. But I would say this as a donor myself, probably not to your charity, but, but a few years ago, I wanted to make. I don't know if you would think it was a modest or a substantial contribution, 2,000 pound donation, to um, assist in the third world. And I genuinely didn't know, I didn't have a clue whether to give this to Oxfam, Planet International, Christian Aid, I had no idea who to give it to. And I investigated this quite thoroughly before I my check over. I, I didn't want to just feel good about myself by writing a check for 2,000 pounds. I wanted to test 
which in these charities I was satisfied would spend the money in the best way. In the same way, if I made purchase for myself of two thousand pounds, I would, you know, think long and hard before, you know, what more than a car would I buy, or what, you know, um, what what new wise green television set. So I think at those sort of levels, charities need to be priced for the same. Uh, that well, I would guess, and that's not a colossal donation, but I mean, that's a reasonable donation where it strikes me as reasonable to expect different charities to if you like, compete and prove to me that my money will be put to best use. If I was only giving a fiver, I wouldn't expect any of your time on the telephone at all, right? That's a kind of random uh, gift that wouldn't justify that. But if you're starting to give hundreds, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, then I actually think it's good for the efficiency of the sector that the donor demand some for the proof of efficiency. Thank you. Fiona. Addressing the first question about mental health charities uh, being squeezed of money, I was slightly shocked. One of the things that I read again while I was thinking on the train about this was a book that I would recommend to all of you called Our Common Good by my friend John Nixon, who really does try to dig into these issues. I was shocked at one of the statistics that he cited where he said that for mental health charities, economic development charities and uh, training and employment charities, less than 1% of their income is in donations. And I was uh, quite concerned about that because uh, it means that tiny charities like yours are just being wiped out. Um, Martin's point about isn't giving a product of the impoverishment of the younger generation. Well, one of the things that is worth noticing is that poorer people actually give a bigger proportion of their income than richer people. And I think that actually that's something that we should shame the rich with. One of the points that I was trying to make is that the number of trillionaires in Britain has gone up massively. And yet we don't see the new Peabody's, the new great philanthropists who are actually investing, not just in giving to existing charities, but actually thinking, you know, George Peabody, when he built all that housing, actually for the first time, one of the things that he did was think about what makes a neighbourhood, what makes a community, what does a housing scheme require? He used his real wealth to change the face of housing in London. And there are still lots of people who live in homes which are only there because of his philanthropy. And I am horrified that despite the immense asset richness of many people in this country, they remain very mean, actually. And I think we need to do something to make people more generous. Sinead was talking about how you get people to give. And I think trust is at the heart of this. And I don't know quite how we can improve it, but one of the things that I didn't say in my original introduction is that the government's attempt to silence charity has, I think, reduced trust in charities so that we can remember Dominic Raab talking about charity sticking to the knitting, wasn't that his phrase? Um, and the lobbying act. I have watched charities be frightened to use what they've learned to try to change government policy. Because the problem is, Mark, charities fail to teach government things because they've been banned from it by the lobbying act, number one. And number two, local authorities decide they know what they want and therefore write contracts which simply drive through the insights which charities could offer them. And that's the wrong way around. What we should be doing is giving them grants and letting them use their knowledge and actually lobby back at governments to say, this is what we've discovered. Sending women to prison is not just a waste of money. It is really punishing their children. And governments don't want to hear that. They just want to hear a nice little, you know, I'll look after the women for you. I'm very glad you brought the lobbying bill up because if somebody else had, I was just about to. Can I ask you before I answer some more questions, Stuart, how much of a chilling effect, what do you think the effect has been? We've been, had an awful lot of elections recently. 
What's been the effect of charities not being allowed to campaign? Okay, there were, there, there were two things, there were separate things. The first was an attempt to introduce uh, gagging clauses into government contracts. Um, that was defeated. Uh, and uh, that was an attempt by the cabinet office to insert those clauses. Those clauses were not inserted. It was the only time in my long, long period at the NCBO where the NCBO was prepared to take government to judicial review. Um, and that succeeded. Uh, the Lobbying Act, I think, is different in the sense that it relates to elections, as you've rightly pointed out. Um, I, I was, to be frank, surprised that the government rejected Lord Hodgson's recommendations. This is a, a well-established, intelligent, conservative peer who reviewed the Act over a very long period of time uh, and made a series of linked, but uh, very sensible, recommendations in relation to reforming the Lobbying Act. Um, now, I can understand that the government is somewhat preoccupied with a legislative programme that doesn't involve anything but one particular issue at the moment, but nevertheless, I expected them to indicate that they would seriously consider Lord Hodgson's recommendations when parliamentary time allowed. And they they rejected that out of hand. Um, and I think we, we were dis very disappointed in that. And I think there's two, there are two effects, the real effects. Uh, well, what Robin Hodgson proposed was the insertion of intent into the, into the situation. So that authority organisations have to intend to influence the outcome of elections. There has to be some uh, restriction on what organisations, including charities, can and can't do during electoral periods, or what they can spend, uh, because otherwise, you know, uh, you get super PACs and you get sort of money being poured into a particular uh, uh, stance. Uh, but I think this has had an effect. There's a lack of clarity, and the Electoral Commission needs to be much clearer, uh, the law needs to be much clearer, on what is meant by uh, reasonable reasonableness in relation to this. Because if you don't define that more clearly, charities will err on the side of caution. And that is what they are doing. Uh, no, there's been no test cases in relation to this. Uh, charities will say, well, hang on a minute, we will err on the side of caution here. There are issues that we want to raise. It was true of the referendum. The referendum was an interesting example. Uh, the Charity Commission got their guidance wrong and had to withdraw their guidance in relation to the referendum because it was too punitive and had no basis, in my view, in law. Certainly the tone was wrong. What did we then find? That one of the Charity Commissions overseeing this had written an essay in support of Brexit. So yeah, there is a sort of very odd thing going on. The assumption that regulation is politically neutral I think it's an assumption that we need to test. But I do think in relation to the Lobbying Act, there's a, there's a great need for this law to be changed. Because until it's clearer, charities will err on the side of caution. They will wish to avoid being prosecuted and fined by the, by the Electoral Commission. And that is what is creating this effect where people are less willing to come forward uh, to express views about public policy issues on which they have experience. Thank you very much. Right. I've lived in both the United States and in Canada, two countries that take very different views of the role of, what, of the state in welfare. Both are far less centralized than, than the UK. But I hear all the same arguments. Uh, what should the state do? What, what should charities do? And uh, what I'm hearing is, you know, we can make this fine adjustment in this policy, or we can rewrite this uh, this law a little bit better. But the question I would ask the panel is, who in the world do you think does this well? And if you can't think of a country that does this well, perhaps this is as good as it with some fine tuning. Maybe this is as good as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Declan Rant. I work for a charity called Praxis, which actually gets some funding from Commonwealth, so thank you for that. Um, I don't think Dominic Rob would want to be in the same room as me in a pair of machine needles anytime soon, I can tell you that. But, um, 
I think there's a huge blindness around the actual cost of what charities do. There's this assumption that somehow we do it for free, that we magically pull these resources out of nowhere with no costs, and we don't. There's a huge range of charities. There are people who do it um, just out of the, the sheer love of doing it. Some are faith communities, they have people living alongside them. There are other professionalised charities which have lots of other costs. Um, but all of us have some costs, even the faith communities need costs for their buildings, to feed the people that they're looking after, all of these kind of things. And volunteers are often seen as the answer as well, but they're not free either. It takes time, it takes money to train and supervise volunteers, all these things cost. And whereas we can be good at doing some things which are innovative, and it's quite easy to fund things if we say, yes, this is innovative, funders love innovation, a lot of the things that we're doing are not innovative, but they're still only doing. So one of the things my charity is doing at the moment is trying to plug the huge gap from the withdrawal of legal aid for most immigration cases. And we shouldn't have to be doing that because that's not something which is innovative. It just involves doing extremely good advice and casework for people. And again, we can't do that universally, so I can give you immigration advice if you come from a particular borough or are a victim of gender-based violence or a member of one of our groups, but otherwise I have to send you away again. And that shouldn't happen. There should be funding for some of these things, which charities do best, yes, definitely, and I think we are best placed to do some things, but we're being expected to do much more, and there's this, this assumption that somehow we're free, we do this for free, and we don't give costs. Thank you. Um, I'm a Brainman's lawyer and a trustee of a charity. Um, and I was just picking up on something that Stuart uh, said earlier about how charities are now increasingly funded um, from the government, and I'm wondering if this new form of funding actually is likely to threaten the long-term welfare of the charity sector. And I say that um, having, uh, because I think there's, there's three uh, reasons that it might undermine the future of the charity sector. The first being uh, the first question, person who asked the question this evening commented on how the tendering process has effectively killed her small charity. Um, the second thing is um, when you see charities receiving very large donations or grants, I should say, from the state, then that can put off individual donors wondering why their small donation might still be worth making. Um, but one thing that we have also seen on, um, in relation to Grenfell Tower is when things go wrong, um, local charities, a number of whom we know, um, who were receiving funds from uh, Kensington and Chelsea, um, immediately those charities uh, who are perceived to be very good local organisations, because they were receiving funds from the council, were immediately uh, sort of stigmatised by the receipt of those funds. Uh, and even uh, organisations like the Red Cross, who went in there and were working alongside the borough, um, they were, um, they were, they come in with great suspicion because people much preferred the volunteer workers who just turned up in a disorganised uh, mob and were just willing to help on the ground. And the organised charities um, had a lot of uh, reasonable scepticism about the role that they were playing at that time. Bit of a long question, but that's it. Thank you. Uh, just explain what you, you mean. I mean, presumably you think that organised charity is better than chaotic, disorganised mobs of people who turn up with cupcakes? Um, I do, but um, the, the issue is the association with, if, if you are essentially a charity and you're receiving, you, you're becoming a provider that's essentially financed by the state, um, then when things go wrong um, and you're tainted by that association, is that not going to undermine the, how people feel in the future about giving to charities? You said previously it was lots of individual donations, now with this increasing tendering process, uh, where charities find themselves essentially at the forefront of, of, of government services because they're being funded by government, is that not likely to undermine... So the you think they should back off altogether, they should just not enter into contracted relationships with the state at all? I, it, that's a really difficult question, it really is. I mean, when, when you hear that small charities are actually closing down because yeah. of it, I mean, would, if, if, if effectively it is the state that's actually funding the work, shouldn't be, they be at the forefront delivering the services and let yeah. charities carry on no. with, the, with the donations they're getting otherwise? Good point. Now, have we, we've got time for just perhaps one or two more. Is there anybody else? 
who hasn't yet had a go. There's somebody here in front. I was just wondering in terms of the, the users, the beneficiaries of charitable work, um, if there is no stunned, no state um, organized, no state organization dealing with these people, um, what happens if a charity is operating unfairly or discriminatorily, or if someone falls through the gaps because they're properly uneligible or just deemed to be undeserving? Um, those people will not be paid for at all if there is no state oversight of this kind of provision. That's well for you, I think, Mark. <laughs> it sounds to me. But also, um, I think it's quite interesting as well to pick up the point about um, legal aid for immigration cases, for instance, which has disappeared. And what we end up with is a sort of hotchpotch of some boroughs who will pay a bit of money, others who won't. You end up with postcode lottery. Mm -hmm. And what you seem to have been advocating, and as do indeed many localists, is exactly that, that it's just <coughs> depends on your locality pretty randomly whether you get, you know, maybe life supporting health help or not. Uh, yes, that's right. I, I think I do advocate that. It's a, it's a little different in the case of immigrants, right? Because it, that does seem to be a sort of literal lottery, whether you happen to have turned up at, you know, Denver or Folkestone, but if the, if the, if the local support you get from legal advice is radically different, that's a slightly different issue. But I, have, I don't have a particular problem with, say, local community X deciding that the local theatre is um, more important than the local school involved. And local community, why deciding that sports are more important than culture? This will be a difference in what you experience as a resident in those different communities. One will have relatively better sports facilities, and one will have relatively better theatrical facilities. Or social care, or no social care. Well, for example, social care, I mean, you might decide, you know, which is, what is the trade off between social care and adult education? Um, uh, it doesn't trouble me per se if some areas of the country decide that they want to spend relatively more on X and relatively less on Y. There are real trade-offs here. I'm not advocating one particular balance or another, but it, it doesn't trouble me particularly if the city of Birmingham has different spending priorities to the city of Liverpool. That's not really a lottery. That would be determined by the election of the mayor or the city council or whatever. And uh, yes, that does mean that social care might be more prioritised in some areas and education might be more prioritised in others. But you know, the, the diversity of life, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with that um, uh, at all. On the falling through the gaps um, point, um, I think this is what the great Friedrich Hayek would say is the fatal conceit. It troubles me, obviously, but it does seem to be pretty evident that the state is not a great backstop of making sure that different people don't fall through the gaps either, whatever its regulatory intent. Uh, there are vast numbers of welfare cases that fall through the gaps. I don't just mean tragic cases. I mean, if you look at the failure to take up many means tested benefits, for example. So even if there's an intent by the state to bring about universality, I'm not sure it always succeeds in that regard. And again, going back to my answer to Sinead, in giving to a charity myself, actually, universality would be a pretty important feature of that. Um, so going back to my decision about uh, which um, any charity I wish to give to, I wouldn't have given to a charity that said, uh, we only help heterosexuals, or we only help Catholics, or we only help Muslims, or we only help boys, or we only help girls. Uh, I would have been absolutely adamant that I wanted the help to be uh, universal. This stigmatisation and, and contagion point, I think, is really interesting. And I don't have an answer to it, other than to say it might be more suitable for courses. I think I'm right, somebody will correct me if this is a little bit near, but the Knife Point Association, the RNLI, uh, was wholly privately funded, then started to take state grants, and sort of saw their reputation fall away as a consequence, that people were therefore not donating at the pub bar or buying raffle tickets, and decided therefore to segue back out of that and be able to make the honest claim we do not receive a penny from government. And that was a kind of market positioning, reputational branding point. And it seems to me that that's what individual charities in the sector need to think about. 
I can well imagine there might be one charity whose comparative advantage and specialisation is being able to use a government role with great efficiency in its local area, far better than the government bureaucracy would spend the money. They will probably struggle a bit more then to raise voluntary donations. Others, like the Lifeboat Association, might wish to, to, to organise their reputation in a different way. Ollie mentioned that we uh, don't reveal our list of donors at my institute, we don't. But one of my great selling points is I'm able to say to everybody that we do is we don't take any penny from the government. We do not get government grants. And in the same way that the Lifeboat Association say that. So I think that's horses for horses, and charities should think about their um, risks and reputation. Uh, just like any other kind of commercial enterprise would. And that doesn't mean there's a one-size-fits-all solution. It will be different for each. I thought this question of who does it well is really interesting. And um, I was interested in what you said, Paul, I'm not uh, religious at all, but the, the, about the lack of evidence for um, uh, theists, not giving more than, than atheists. Uh, that's fascinating. I couldn't say who does philanthropy the best in terms of efficiency, but I think it's at least interesting that philanthropic giving in the USA is hugely greater than it is in the United Kingdom. I think across virtually every sector, you know, if you, can, if you consider political donations, like if you're multi-millionaires, you know, middle-class people will give $100 or two to a, to a candidate in an election. This would be you know, considered extremely weird in the United Kingdom, or statistically unusual uh, to make such a donation. And similarly for... And not charitable. Uh, and not charitable. So is it American culture? Is it that uh, America is a more white place society than the United Kingdom? Is it the tax system? I don't know. But if you wanted to capture in a bottle a country that has much greater philanthropic giving than us, for all its warts and all its problems, it is the USA. Stuart. Uh, just a couple of your final I will, yeah. I'll pick up the line I point there. Took government money once for one year. I think it was 1927. Because <laughs> um, uh, they, uh, they, they, they got out of it very quickly. Um, and not uh, principally because they, the, the bureaucracy that surrounded it was so great that they didn't want to do it. Um, and interestingly, their problem was the reverse. Their problem was that people, particularly donors, thought that they were a government agency. And so they ran a brilliant campaign once with a picture of a lifeboat and with all of the equipment costed out uh, and explained that uh, they did. It was a very interesting debate, just on the other hand, I think, um, about whether, uh, you may recall that Air Sea Rescue was uh, previously provided by the armed forces, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force, um, and the government wanted to stop doing that. And there was a discussion with the Iron Ally about whether they'd take it over. And of course, they didn't take it over. One of, one of the reasons was running helicopters is extremely expensive business. And uh, they didn't want to get into contracting for that. So eventually, it was put out to private uh, organizations rather than, rather than charitable, uh, charitable ones. I just want to pick up the, 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 the Grenville Tower point that the gentleman made here. Um, I think it was a really interesting case. Uh, it, it's a rare case, thankfully. Um, and I think charitable response to terrorist attacks has been very different from the charitable response to the Grenfell Tower incident. Um, talking to the Red Cross's chief exec, so what you've got to remember is with terrorist cases, um, there is no connectivity between the victims other than they have to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. With Grenfell, that was very different. This was a community. Um, and so people all knew what other people was engaged on was. And that creates a very different psychological response. It was clear that the local authority was overwhelmed by what happened and was unable to respond. Uh, and that's why a golf commander was appointed from another local authority. But the tension was mainly uh, not between um, uh, the, the, the grassroots, uh, I don't think, People turned up with blankets and food. A very understandable voluntary action response. You see something, you want to do something. That's something that I think Ron would, would, would commend. It was actually around money flows. It was the fact that there were all sorts of, uh, there was crowdfunding, there was a community foundation, there was the Red Cross, and that created quite a lot of tension. 
because various people who were recipients of the money um, all thought it was their responsibility. And ultimately, it's an interesting discussion about the role of the state and the role of regulation. Ultimately, the state in the form of uh, government and particularly the regulator had to draw those people together to get the solution. So sometimes civil society is a chaotic response and sometimes that needs to be orchestrated, particularly I think in circumstances such as we saw in uh, the tragedy of West London. Thanks. Yeah. I think you've got spot on. It's as good as it gets and it sort of reflects the rest of society. And I think charity brings two things. It brings money, obviously, which is spent illogically because it's from the heart. But also it brings cohesion amongst the volunteers. And that volunteering is effectively money. It's time, time is money. And you know, I don't do very much on Santa Claus on a steam train. I like steam trains, and it's great fun. I only do it for four days, for the weekend, before Christmas. And I know I'm the wrong bill, don't worry. <laughs> but it, it, I, I get a lot out of it. And I think charities and communities, whether it's a cancer research shop, or whether it's driving old people for, for lunch somewhere, people get something out of it. They get it together, so they wouldn't get without it. So I think it's probably as good as it gets. I can't think how you can improve it. And I don't think anyone else has any idea. That's very encouraging. Fiona. <laughs> well, I didn't think I would agree with Mark about anything, but I do actually agree with him about the way in which in the USA they do generate the idea of charitable giving being something to be proud of and to aspire to. And I don't think that we celebrate those who give anything like enough in the UK. Uh, I think if there is an example where things are done better, I think actually in Northern Ireland we've done it quite well. And one of the reasons for that is the role that charities played during the, pretty, the peace process. That, that actually they were very community-based charities who helped some of the reaching across between communities, which broke down some of the barriers which were huge, physical, emotional, cultural, and so on. So I don't know where, where does it well, but I do admire America for the fact that it celebrates giving as much as it does. Um, the Sister from Praxis is absolutely right that one of the things that charities do is they do things which aren't innovative but actually have got to be done. And one of the things that I don't think we celebrate anything like enough is the role of charities in giving advice. Because... So many people just need advice. And one of the things that I think, as someone who's always been involved in charities, the aim of a charity is to, as far as possible, enable a person to look after themselves rather than to kind of be helpless, is to actually give them agency again. Uh, I was at a, a launch of a charity which had been a political campaign just for domestic workers, yesterday and they have just got charitable status and I was trying to work out why this organisation of women who most of whom have very dodgy immigration status I was very glad that there was no one there from anyway um, uh, why, why has it worked so well and I know why it's worked so well because there was an inspiring woman who was herself a domestic worker who brought them together and they made food together and they danced together and they made songs together and she rescued some of them from the most vile exploitation, sleeping on floors, not actually getting fed by their employers, having their passports stolen from them. But actually what she did was give them hope and connectedness and a sense of agency. And I think that's one of the things that charities are actually better at than the state. Now, that doesn't mean that I think charities should do everything. I really don't, because I do think that the state can deliver universality. But I think that it is one of the things that we should celebrate that charities do. Um, you know, this, this event is, is, is sponsored by Bindman's and blessed Bindman's, because one of the things that he has done in the years that I've known it is do pro bono work on things like immigration advice. Uh, I ran 30 years ago or more 
the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. And one of our strap lines was we don't take any government money. And the reason why that was a strap line was really to kind of assert our independence. And I think that the ways in which government has silenced charities has, through the Lobbying Act and through commissioning and through <coughs> regulations like that, they've kind of diminished the independence of charities so that one of the wonderful features that a charity can have, which is poking government in the eye when it needs it, to say, you are being really stupid and you are being unfair and disabling people, you know, charities aren't just there to put the blasters on. They're to stop people bleeding. And I think that we've really got to try to do that. On, on the issue of whether tendering grants from the state and so on diminishes trust in charities, I, it potentially does. But I think this silencing thing does more. And I think that if charities can assert from their experience of what they do the kind of change that should happen unashamedly, I think that would uh, happen less. The final point about that was developing about um, kind of... Uh, I'm quite happy to have uh, postcode lotteries and so on. The pro problem is if you have a postcode lottery and most people in your area want a theatre, well, that's lovely. It's really not acceptable if it means that someone actually has to sit in their own piss all weekend. And that's the kind of choice that's being made. It's not, do we have a theatre or a swimming pool? It's actually the things that we don't see. And that's one of the important roles of the state is actually really being accountable for the hidden stuff, for, to try to say that we do not believe a civil, in a civilised society people should sit in their own piss every weekend. And let me tell you, today there are people who are doing exactly that because they can't afford the products that will mean that they can stay dry because there might not be a district nurse because all of those things mean that they don't happen. And it's really unacceptable to say, oh, well, there's a charity that deals with old ladies, frankly, because the state has to say there is a minimum standard that we are not prepared in a civilised society to allow anyone to fall beneath. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and will you please thank our panel?